Το βίντεο αυτό είναι για σένα, αν έχεις περάσει το lower. Είναι για σένα, αν έχεις περάσει το proficiency και θέλεις να φρεσκάρεις τα αγγλικά σου. Είναι για σένα μικρό μου, μικρή μου, αλλά και κύριε μου, κύριε μου, αν θέλετε επίσης να φρεσκάρετε τα δικά σας αγγλικά και να κάνετε και μια μικρή, ας πούμε, επανάληψη α, στην προφορά κάποιων πραγμάτων. Εγώ λοιπόν σήμερα θα σας βοηθήσω σε αυτό, γιατί μ' αρέσει αυτό που κάνω πάρα πολύ και ειδικά όταν μιλάω για τέτοια θέματα. Όπως ο Τιτανικός. Καλησπέρα, είμαι η Μέρη Πρόεδρε, δασκάλα αγγλικών από το Βόλο, τον όμορφο Βόλο από την Ελλάδα. Εκπέμπουμε σε ολόκληρο τον κόσμο μέσω του YouTube και φυσικά θα σας αφήσω από κάτω και κάποια πάρα πολύ ωραία links στην, ε, με, στην περιγραφή, στην, στο description, έτσι ώστε να μπορέσετε να μπείτε και σε κάποια βίντεο, τα οποία θεωρώ top όσον αφορά το εν λόγω θέμα. Πάμε λοιπόν, History Channel, The Titanic. Titanic. The Titanic was a luxury British steamship that sank in the early hours of April 15, 1912, after striking an iceberg leading to the deaths of more than 1,500 passengers and crew. RMS Titanic. <clears throat> the RMS Titanic, a luxury steamship, sank in the early hours of April 15, 1912, off the coast of Newfoundland in the North Atlantic after side swiping an iceberg during its maiden voyage. Of the 2,240 passengers and crew on board, more than 1,500 lost their lives in the disaster. Titanic has inspired countless books, articles and films, including the 1997 Titanic movie starring Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, and the ship's story has entered the public consciousness as a cautionary tale about the perils of human hubris. The building of the Titanic. The Titanic was the product of intense competition among rival shipping lines in the first half of the 20th century. In particular, the White Star Line found itself in a battle for steamship primacy with Cunard, a venerable British firm with two standout ships that ranked among the most sophisticated and luxurious of their time. Cunard's Mauritania began service in 1907 and quickly set a speed record for the fastest average speed during a transatlantic crossing, 23.69 knots or 27.26 miles per hour, a title that it held for 22 years. Cunard's other master ship, Lusitania, launched the same year and was lauded for its spectacular interiors. Lusitania met its tragic end on May 7, 1915, when a torpedo fired by a German U-boat sunk the ship, killing nearly 1,000 200 of the 1,959 people on board and precipitating the United States entry into World War I. The same year that Cunard unveiled its two magnificent liners, 
J. Bruce Ismay, chief executive of White Star, discussed the construction of three large ships with William J. Peary, chairman of the shipbuilding company Harland and Wolf. Part of a new Olympic class of liners, each ship would measure 882 feet in length and 92.5 feet at their broadest point, making them the largest of their time. In March 1909, work began in the massive Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, Ireland, on the second of these three ocean liners, Titanic, and continued non-stop for two years. On May 31, 1911, Titanic's immense hull, the largest movable man-made object in the world at the time, made its way down the slipways and into the River Lagan in Belfast. More than 100,000 people attended the launching, which took over just one minute and went off without a hitch. The hull was immediately towed to a mammoth fitting, fitting out dock, where thousands of workers would spend most of the next year building the ship's decks, constructing her lavish interiors and installing the 29 giant boilers that would power her two main steam engines. Unsinkable Titanic's fatal flaws. According to some hypothesis, Titanic was doomed from the start by a design that many lauded as state-of-the-art. <coughs> Excuse me. The Olympic-class ships featured a double bottom and 15 watertight bulk head compartments equipped with electric watertight doors that could be operated individually or simultaneously by a switch on the bridge. It was these watertight bulkheads that inspired Shipbuilder magazine in a special issue devoted to the Olympic liners to deem them practically unsinkable. But the watertight compartment design contained a flaw that was a critical factor in Titanic's sinking while the individual bulkheads were indeed watertight, the walls separating the bulkheads extended only a few feet above the water line, so water could pour from one compartment into another, especially if the ship began to list or pitch forward. <clears throat> The second critical safety lapse that contributed to the loss of so many lives was the inadequate number of lifeboats carried on Titanic. A mere 16 boats plus four Engelhard collapsibles could accommodate just 1,178 people. Titanic could carry up to 2,435 passengers and a crew of approximately 900 brought her capacity to more than 3,300 people. As a result, even if the lifeboats were loaded to full capacity during an emergency evacuation, there were available seats for only one-third of those on board. While unthinkably inadequate by today's standards, Titanic's supply of lifeboats actually exceeded 
the British Board of Trade's requirements. Passengers on the Titanic Titanic created quite a stir when it departed for its maiden voyage from Southampton, England on April 10, 1912. After stops in Cherbourg, France, and Queenstown, now known as Cobb, Ireland, the ship set sail for New York with 2,240 passengers and crew, or souls, the expression then used in the shipping industry, usually in connection with the sinking on board. As befitting the first transatlantic crossing of the world's most celebrated ship, many of these souls were high-ranking officials, wealthy industrialists, dignitaries and celebrities. First and foremost was the White Star Line's managing director, J. Bruce Ismay, accompanied by Thomas Andrews, the ship's builder from Harland and Wolf. Absent was financier J.P. Morgan, whose International Merchantile Marine Shipping Trust controlled the White Star Line and who had selected Ismay as a company officer. Morgan had planned to join his associates on Titanic but cancelled at the last minute when some business matters delayed him. The wealthiest passenger was John Jacob Astor IV, heir to the Astor family fortune, who had made waves a year earlier by marrying 18-year-old Madeleine Talmage Force a young woman, 29 years his junior, shortly after divorcing his first wife. Other notable passengers included the elderly owner of Macy's, Isidore Strauss, and his wife Ida. Industrialist Benjamin Guggenheim, accompanied by his mistress, valet, and chauffeur and widow and heiress Margaret Molly Brown, who would earn her nickname the unsinkable Molly Brown by helping to maintain calm and order while the lifeboats were being loaded and boosting the spirits of her fellow survivors. The employees attending to this collection of first-class luminaries were mostly travelling second class, along with academics, tourists, journalists and others who would enjoy a level of service and accommodations equivalent to first class on most other ships. But, by far, the largest group of passengers was the third class. More than 700 exceeding the other two levels combined. Some had paid less than $20 to make the crossing. It was third class that was the major source of profit for shipping lines like White Star and Titanic was designed to offer these passengers accommodations and amenities superior to those found in third class on any other ship of that era. Titanic sets sail, begins the journey. Titanic's departure from Southampton on April 10th was not without some oddities. A small coal fire was discovered in one of her bunkers, an alarming but not uncommon occurrence on steamships of the day. Stockers hosed down the smouldering coal and shoveled it aside to reach the base of the blaze. 
After assessing the situation, the captain and chief engineer concluded that it was unlikely it had caused any damage that could affect the hull structure, and the stokers were ordered to continue controlling the fire at sea. According to a theory put forth by a small number of Titanic experts, the fire became uncontrollable after the ship left Southampton, forcing the crew to attempt a full speed crossing. Moving at such a fast pace, they were unable to avoid the fatal collision with the iceberg. Another unsettling event took place when Titanic left the Southampton dock. As she got underway, she narrowly escaped a collision with the America Line's SS New York. Superstitious Titanic buffs sometimes point to this as the worst kind of omen for a ship departing on her maiden voyage. The Titanic strikes an iceberg. On April 14th, after four days of uneventful sailing, Titanic received sporadic reports of ice from other ships, but she was sailing on calm seas under a moonless, clear sky. At about 11.30 p.m., a lookout saw an iceberg coming out of a slight haze dead ahead, then rang the warning bell and telephoned the bridge. The engines were quickly reversed and the ship was turned sharply instead of making direct impact. Titanic seemed to graze along the side of the berg, spr sorry, sprinkling ice fragments on the forward deck. Sensing no collision, the lookouts were relieved. They had no idea that the iceberg had a jagged underwater spur which slashed a 300-foot gash in the hull below the ship's waterline. But the time, by the time the captain toured the damaged area with Harland and Wolf's Thomas Andrews, five compartments were already filling with seawater and the bow of the doomed ship was alarmingly pitched downward, allowing seawater to pour from one bulkhead into the neighboring compartment. Andrews did a quick calculation and estimated that Titanic might remain afloat for an hour and a half, perhaps slightly more. At that point, the captain who had already instructed his wireless operator to call for help, ordered the lifeboats to be loaded. Titanic's lifeboats. A little more than an hour after contact with the iceberg, a largely disorganized and haphazard evacuation began with the lowering of the first lifeboat. The craft was designed to hold 65 people. It left with only 28 aboard. Tragically, this was to be the norm. During the confusion and chaos during the precious hours before Titanic plunged into the sea, nearly every lifeboat would be launched woefully underfilled, some with only a handful of passengers. In compliance with the law of the sea, women and children boarded the boats first. Only when there were no women or children nearby were men permitted to board. Yet, many of the victims were in fact women and children, the result of disorderly procedures that failed to get them to the boats in the first place. Exceeding Andrew's prediction, Titanic stubbornly stayed afloat 
for close to three hours, those hours witnessed acts of craven cowardice and extraordinary bravery. Hundreds of human dramas unfolded between the order to load the lifeboats and the ship's final plunge. Men saw off wives and children. Families were separated in the confusion and selfless individuals gave up their spots to remain with loved ones or allow a more vulnerable passenger to escape. In the end, 706 people survived the sinking of the Titanic. Titanic sinks. The ship's most illustrious passengers each responded to the circumstances with conduct that has become an integral part of the Titanic legend. Ismay, the White Star managing director, helped load some of the boats and later stepped onto a collapsible as it was being lowered. Although no women or children were in the vicinity when he abandoned ship, he would never live down the ignominy of surviving the disaster while so many others perished. Thomas Andrews, Titanic's chief designer, was last seen in the first class smoking room, staring blankly at a painting of a ship on the wall. Astor deposited his wife Madeleine into a lifeboat and remarking that she was pregnant, asked if he could accompany her. Refused entry, he managed to kiss her goodbye just before the boat was lowered away. Although offered a seat on account of his age, Isidore Strauss refused any special consideration and his wife Ida would not leave her husband behind. The couple retired to their cabin and perished together. Benjamin Guggenheim and his valet returned to their rooms and changed into formal evening dress. Emerging onto the deck, he famously declared, we are dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Molly Brown helped load the boats and finally was forced into one of the last to leave. She implored its crewmen to turn back for survivors, but they refused, fearing they would be swamped by desperate people trying to escape the icy seas. Titanic, nearly perpendicular and with many of her lights still aglow, finally dove beneath the ocean's surface at about 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912. Throughout the morning, Cunard's Carpathia, after receiving Titanic's distress call at midnight and steaming at full speed while dodging ice floes all night, rounded up all of the lifeboats. They contained only 705 survivors. Aftermath of the Titanic catastrophe. At least five separate boards of inquiry on both sides of the Atlantic conducted comprehensive hearings on Titanic's sinking, interviewing dozens of witnesses and consulting with many maritime experts. Every conceivable subject was investigated, from the conduct of the officers and crew to the construction of the ship. Titanic conspiracy theories abounded. While it has always been assumed that the ship sank as a result of the gash that caused the bulkhead compartments to flood, various other theories have emerged over the decades including that the ship's steel plates were too brittle for the near-freezing Atlantic waters, that the impact caused rivets to pop 
and that the expansion joints failed, among others. Technological aspects of the catastrophe aside, Titanic's demise has taken on a deeper, almost mythic meaning in popular culture. Many view the tragedy as a morality play about the dangers of human hubris. Titanic's creators believed they had built an unsinkable ship that could not be defeated by the laws of nature. So, my dear friends, I would like to show you now some of the pictures before the wreck as Titanic used to be and some pictures after the wreck. So, let's begin. Let's go to the before part. So here we have one of the many pictures that was taken of the Titanic's um, propellers and some of the workmen. You see what a gigantic man-made object it was. <clears throat> Amazing picture. This is one of my favorites. The Grand Staircase. Mr. Ismar the guy who actually survived the wreck. One picture of the Titanic and then another floating away. People saying goodbye to their loved ones who knew they would never see them again, at least some of them. Uh, the famous captain, Mr. John Smith. He went down with the ship. And Let's have a look at, I suppose I made a mistake here. Let's have a look at the after, some of the plates. So sorry, okay. I don't know what's going on. Just give me a moment. Okay, um, let's try once more to see some of the pictures of the after. I suppose that we are okay now. So these were some of the plates that are almost intact, like somebody actually put them there very, very gently. And... This is a picture of the actual wreckage from above. This is one part, the big part, and down here there's uh, remotely another, the smaller part. Gloves belonging to one of the passengers. This is a picture of one of the robots investigating the wreck because it is very, very dangerous for the people to actually go down there. Mr. Uh, Ballard, the guy who actually discovered the wreck in 1985. This is actually a drawing of the ship. It wasn't a real picture, of course, but it shows us, you know, how the ship actually went down. And another drawing, a little bit more dramatic, something that, that the passengers, the, um, uh, the people rescued, could see as they were actually floating away from the ship itself. So underneath in the uh, description box I'm going to leave you two links as I said before and I hope you enjoyed uh, this video tonight. I did my best to show you what I really love and this is what I really love and I would like to thank you for this and I'm going to see you very very soon in my next video. Kisses!